Benjamin Franklin once said, money has never made man happy, nor will it. There is nothing in its nature to produce happiness. The more of it one has, the more one wants. Ladies, now that's a quote that is over 300 years old, and yet it still rings true as evidenced by the following stories. Chicagoan Yuraj Khan found out the hard way that the lottery isn't always a winning game. The 46-year-old had just sworn off lottery tickets, save for just one more in June 2012, buying a scratch-off at his local 7-Eleven convenience store. And he wouldn't need a single ticket more after he revealed a $1 million jackpot on the ticket. Khan chose to cash out the reward in one lump sum instead of installments waiting for his $425,000 check from the state. The check was issued on July 19th, but Khan wouldn't have the chance to cash it. He was pronounced dead the very next day. Authorities determined his death was of natural causes due to hardened arteries. However, an extensive chemical test resulted in a shock that he actually had ingested cyanide, which was a lethal poisoning. Chicago police are now treating the investigation as a homicide, though they have not yet revealed if there's any leads in the case. Someone did profit off of Khan's $425,000. His winnings were cashed on August 15th, likely by his estate. Another guy, Billy Bob, thought his problems were over when he won the 31 million Texas Lotto jackpot. Nearly broke and constantly moving between low paying jobs with a wife and three children to support, the first of his 1.24 million annual payouts seemed like the light at the end of the tunnel. Instead, it was the beginning of the anus horribleness for the 47 year old Texan. Oh, it started out joyful. He quit his job at Home Depot, took his family to Hawaii, donated tens of thousands of dollars to his church, bought cars and houses for his friends and family, and even donated 480 turkeys to the poor. But his lavish spending attracted unwanted attention, and he had to change his phone number several times after strangers called to demand donations. Barbara Jean, who was his wife, separated less than a year later, and it was the straw that broke the camel's back. His son found him dead inside his home with a self-inflicted gunshot wound shortly before he was set to have dinner with his ex-wife. While family members disputed the idea that he could not have committed suicide, he clearly was not happy. In fact, he told a financial advisor shortly before his death, winning the lottery is the worst thing that has ever happened to me. William Post, another one, he won $16.2 million in the Pennsylvania lottery. He fell victim to crime, bankruptcy, tragedy, and simply poor spending habits. In the two weeks after he received his first annual payment of nearly $500,000, he had already blown two-thirds of it, purchased a restaurant, a used car lot, and an airplane. His reckless spending continued. Within three months, he was $500,000 in debt. But numbers were the least of his problems. According to Yahoo News, Post's brother was arrested for hiring a hitman to try to kill him and his sixth wife. Yes, his sixth wife. His relatives convinced him to invest in worthless business ventures, and his landlady duped him into handling over a third of his cash. He ultimately filed for bankruptcy, faced a stint in jail for firing a gun at a bill collector. He says, everybody dreams of winning money, but nobody realizes the nightmares that come out of the woodwork or the problems. He went on to say, I was much happier when I was broke. He died of respiratory failure in 2006 at the age of 66, leaving behind his seventh wife and nine children from his second marriage. Last but not least, teenager Callie Rogers won $3 million, showered her friends and family with gifts. Then the 16-year-old treated her loved ones to presents, cars, homes, lavish vacations. She also spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on partying, breast implants, and designer clothing. But she reported bank bankruptcy in 2009. She said, I just wanted to make people happy by spending money on them, but it hasn't made me happy. It just made me anxious. People are only after me for my money. 
She reportedly attempted suicide twice after winning it big, and she was now ready to embrace her poverty. To make ends meet, she started working three cleaning jobs and moved in with her mother. And I quote her, My life is a shamble, and hopefully now that all the money is gone, I can find some happiness. It's brought me nothing but unhappiness. It has ruined my life, she says, end of quote. Now, ladies, that does, I could have gone on and on. That doesn't sound like a lot of happy, rich people to me, does it to you? And you might be thinking, yikes, after listening to those stories, I think I'm going to pray to be poor, uh, which might not be a bad idea. However, we as believers in Jesus Christ know that God's word is clear on the subject of money, and especially those who are rich. He is the one that gives the power to give wealth, and he is the one that has the ability to take away your wealth. The Lord is is Lord over the rich and the poor. And ladies, the fact of the matter is this. There will always be rich people. There's always been rich people, and there will always be rich people. But the question you and I have to face this evening is this. What should be the attitude of those who are rich, especially those who belong to the Lord? What should be the attitude that they possess? Well, Paul this evening is going to answer that question. He's going to give four commands in this lesson for those who are rich. And there's two positive commands and there are two negative commands. And so let's read verses 17 to 19 of chapter 6 and discover what they are. Notice what he says. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they would be rich in good works, willing to give, ready to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Now, as we met last week, we saw Paul is winding down his letter to Timothy. We have tonight and then one more lesson, but he's winding down his letter to his spiritual son, Timothy, and he reminded him last week, if you were here, to fight the good fight of faith. And he gave Timothy 10 motivations that he must keep in mind uh, as he follows the Lord. And I won't repeat all those, but hopefully you have them in your notes from last week. The outline for our lesson tonight, we're going to see four commands to the rich. As I said, two positive, two negative. And quite nicely, they fit in an acrostic rich. I love it when that happens. So, uh, you know, maybe you think all Susan Heck knows to do is acrostics, but I really do know other stuff. But it's always fun when it does fall into an acrostic. So you can just write rich, R-I-C-H, and uh, there we'll have it. Now, remember, Paul had already previously warned Timothy of the dangers of those who love money, and you looked at some of that in your homework. But now he's warning not necessarily those who love money. They don't desire to be rich, but they just have money. They are just rich. In God's providential design, they have a lot of money. There were rich people in the city of Ephesus, just like there's rich people right here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And so Paul is going to briefly address, before he closes the letter, uh, he's going to command the rich. And so he begins in verse 17 with the first three commands for the rich. He says, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty. Now, as mentioned, Paul's already dealt with the danger of loving money and the sorrows that come of that. We saw that many men drown themselves in destruction. They pierce themselves through uh, with many sorrows, just like that animal that falls in a trap and those stakes uh, kill him. And so we already have studied that. But ladies, obviously a lot of people have money who do not necessarily have a sinful desire for it. They just have money. They're rich because of either hard work, or they're rich because of wise investments, or they're rich because you know their parents died, or their grandparents died, or some relative died and left them a wealthy inheritance. And so there's lots of reasons that some people could be rich. 
In fact, it's interesting, the city of Ephesus was known as the leading city of the wealthy in Paul and Timothy's day. And we know that Paul is writing to Timothy, who is pastoring at the church at Ephesus. And so there was a lot of rich people there in the city of Ephesus. And so obviously, because Timothy's a pastor, there would be lots of rich people there in his congregation. They might say, well, how did people in biblical times get money anyway? How did they get rich? Well, mainly the way people got their money in biblical times was they would own a lot of property, a lot of land, and they would rent it out to either uh, tenants or they would rent it out to farmers, and then they would receive a percentage of the crops. And so if you rented out you know, a piece of property to somebody and they had some kind of uh, cattle or they had um, you know, something they were growing, then you would get a percentage of the crop earnings. Another way in biblical times that people earned money was by merchant ships. And if you did any reading in uh, uh, First Kings, you saw that. Remember in Solomon's day, the sailors brought back commodities, gold, silver, ivory, uh, even monkeys from other countries. And so that was another way that many times uh, people would get rich in the biblical times. So what are the rich to do? What are the rich to do, especially if they belong to the Lord? They are Christians. Well, Paul begins by telling Timothy what they are to do. And he starts out by saying, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty. Now, the word command means to charge or transmit a message to someone. So Paul is telling Timothy, look, Timothy, you need to get this message to them, okay? Transmit this message to those who are rich. Now, the Greek word for rich means those who would be abounding with wealth. Those who are abounding with wealth. Now, some of you might already be tuning me out, and maybe you're going to take a nap before you go home tonight and go to bed. And you may be tuning me out, and you're saying, you know, this lesson does not apply to me because I am not rich. But, dear sister, every one of you in this room is filthy rich. You, want, you know what I say? You know why I say that? Did you know half of the world lives on less than $2.50 a day? Half of the world lives on $2.50 a day, and 80% of the world lives on $10 a day. 80% of the world lives on $10 a day. And if you've ever traveled to a foreign country, like I have, either Honduras or India, uh, then you know what I'm talking about. And most of the world lives in poverty. And so this lesson does apply to you. Even the poorest person in here tonight, you are filthy rich in comparison to the rest of the world. In fact, uh, when I have gone overseas uh, to travel, I am always sobered when I come back to America, when I think about what my fellow American Christians think that they need in order to live. And I think everybody should go to a third world country, and it will give you a different perspective. So, the first command to the rich, and that would be you, dear sister, the first command to the rich is they're not to be haughty. They're not to be haughty. This is the first negative command, and this is the H on your acrostic. Haughtiness is forbidden. Haughtiness is forbidden. Now, the word haughty means to be high-minded, to be high-minded. People who have money are not to think that money is all that matters. They're not to think their value in life comes from their money. They're not to be snobs, which usually occurs when you have a lot of money. Now, I'm going to give you a few illustrations tonight. I normally don't talk a lot about my personal life, but I'm going to share this with you because I think it will help uh, maybe in this lesson this evening. But I remember when my husband, many, many years ago, wanted to move to a home after my kids went off to college and he wanted to move out of the home we were in that we'd raised our children in and he wanted to move into a, a different neighborhood that would have been a step up for us. And at that time he had inherited some money from his parents and he wanted to buy a home that would be an investment for us. And uh, I loved where we were at the time. I did not want to move and I appealed graciously to him to please let us stay in the house that we were in. But um, nonetheless, as a good submissive wife, I eventually, you know, followed him along to that home. And uh, we did move in that home. We lived there 13 plus years. But you know what, ladies? Snobbery was exactly what I discovered among my new neighbors. 
As I said, the other neighborhood had a sense of community. And it was difficult being in that neighborhood. I never really felt like that home was my home for those 13 years. But not, as hard as we would try, we would have people in our home for supper. We would try to get to know our neighbors. We would be friendly with, with them. Do you know we were never welcomed in that neighborhood? Never. In all those years, and Rita can testify to this, in all those years, I never felt comfortable even asking one of them to get my mail if Doug and I had to be out of town because Rita was always the one that went and got my mail during those times. And she lives a mile away from me. Now we're living somewhere else, almost for a year now, and I will tell you the difference is amazing. I only live in this neighborhood a year, and my neighbors are friendly, and they are welcoming, and so I'm very thankful. Well, Paul now gives the second negative command for the rich, and I guess it's nice that he gets the negative ones out of the way. Not only are the rich not to be haughty, but they're also not to trust in uncertain riches. This is the R on your acrostic. Riches are not to be trusted. Riches are not to be trusted. Ladies, we're not to put our confidence in riches. You can't bank on them. This also was illustrated to me in my life, as I'm sure it has been illustrated in your life many, many times. I remember in 2008, I was away on a speaking engagement and I was in a restaurant and my husband called me and I knew something was terribly wrong by the tone of his voice. And so I excused myself and I went out into the parking lot of the restaurant. As I just mentioned, he had inherited a lot of money from his parents when they passed and so he had invested it and we were financially independent at the time. We didn't even take a salary from the church that he was pastoring at that time. So anyway, I go out to the parking lot, I can tell my husband is upset, and he proceeds to tell me the dilemma he was in, and he was asking me, what should I do? Susan, what do you think I should do? And it was a financial dilemma. Of course, I had no idea at the time when he was talking to me that this was not just an isolated incident that was affecting us, but the incident was going to go down in history as the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. And for those of you that remember 2008, it is now known, she's shaking her head, Jean, or Jeanette's shaking her head, it's now known as the financial crisis of 2007, 2008, or the global financial crisis. If you remember during that time, many banks were in danger of collapsing. Remember the government came in and bailed them out. The stock market dropped. People had to leave their homes. There were all these homes in foreclosure. There was this huge unemployment rate. In fact, uh, they even said, I even read in the last few days, that you know we still have not recovered uh, from that as far as that our nation is concerned. And it was a difficult time for many. And for us, we lost two thirds of our assets, which we never regained, which is why we moved, and which is now my, why my husband now takes a salary. And ladies, I share, with the, I share this with you, some of you know this, but I share this with you as a group, as a living illustration that riches cannot be trusted in. Just because you might have them now, they cannot be trusted in. Riches come and riches go. In fact, the other day I was at my daughter's house and she said, Mom, you know, we just got such and such amount back from the, from the IRS and I was so excited because maybe we could do this now and do that. And she goes, and then guess what happens? The bills start coming in or something unexpected comes. And she said, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And uh, that's the way it is. Riches come and riches go. Ladies, don't put your trust in such nonsense. Proverbs 23, 5 says, Will you set your eyes on that which is not? For riches make themselves wings, and they fly away like the eagle toward heaven. Psalm 62.10 says, Do not trust in oppression, nor vain hope in robbery. If riches increase, don't set your heart on them. Ladies, there's something much better to put your trust in. As Paul moves from the negative to the positive, and he gives the first command, the first positive command to the rich. Notice what he says. Instead of trusting in riches, the rich are to trust in the living God. This is the C on your acrostic. Confidence for the rich must be in God alone. Confidence for the rich must be in God alone. Now, 
Why should those who are rich trust in the living God over riches? Well, hopefully you saw some of that as you thought about that homework question. Ladies, riches come and go, but God does not, right? He does not come and go, come and go. He no, never, no, never leaves us or forsake us. He is always there, but money does forsake us, right? What is it? One comedian said, if, if money ever talks, all it says to me is goodbye. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's the truth, isn't it? Money's, money is not the same yesterday, today, or forever. But he is. Jesus is. He's the same today. He's the same as he was yesterday, and he will be the same forever. In fact, Paul describes money as uncertain, but God is living. Ladies, money is not alive, and one day it's going to be burned up. You know, the whole world, what world catches on fire, as Peter talks about, and Second Peter's going to burn up. But you know what? God is alive. God is alive and will live forever. But Paul gives a reason as, as well as to why the rich must trust in God over their riches, and he puts it like this. Notice what he says. Because he gives us richly all things to enjoy. The word gives us richly means he furnishes abundantly. And the word enjoy means to have full enjoyment. Ladies, he's the one that gives us the ability to enjoy what we do have. Without a living relationship with him, we can't even enjoy the things that we do have. Without knowing the one who's given us the ability to get wealth, as Deuteronomy 8.18 reminds us, it's difficult to enjoy the things he's given us. I mean, think of those, those stories that I read to you in the beginning. Did any of those people enjoy their money? No. And if I were to venture out, I would say that all of them were probably lost. They did not know Christ. And so it was impossible for them to enjoy the things that God has given them. Ladies, God is the one who gives you the ability to enjoy what you have. He gives you the ability to enjoy the blessings you have, you know, your food, um, home, your, you know, anything that you have that is material, your car, your flowers outside that are blooming right now. God is the one that gives you that ability to enjoy that thing. He's the giver of life. And he's created all things for us to enjoy. Jesus himself said, Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And he who seeks find. And to him that knocks it will be opened. What man is there among you? If a son asks for bread, will he give him a stone? If he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you being evil then know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father in heaven give what? Give good things to those that ask. And ladies, the Lord is always wanting to bless us with different things. And uh, it's, but we can't enjoy that apart from a relationship with him. And so Paul is making it very clear here. Trust in God. Put your confidence in God who is able to give you that ability to enjoy those things that he gives you. Wise Rich, Rich Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 5.18, Here is what I have seen. It's good and fitting for one to eat and drink, and enjoy the good of all his labor in which he toils under the sun all the days of his life, which God gives him, for it is his heritage. As for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth and given him power to eat of it, to receive his heritage and rejoice in his labor, this is a gift of God. For he will not dwell unduly on the days of his life because God keeps him busy with the joy of his heart. Ladies, without knowing God, None of us can really enjoy anything that he has given us. But with a living relationship with the living God, we can enjoy all the things that he has given to us. In fact, I don't know about you, but I think I mentioned this a few weeks ago. I think it's ironic that most rich people that I know are the most unhappiest people I have ever met. Because they don't have a relationship with the living God and they're not able to enjoy what God's given them. In fact, John Rockefeller, who was one of the richest men in the world, said this, I have made millions, but they have brought me no happiness. I would barter them all for the days I sat in an office in Cleveland and counted myself rich on $3 a week. Millions he made, no happiness. He'd rather go back to work in that office at $3 a week. That's when he was happy, not with all the money. So, maybe you're wondering, what should the rich do with all their money? Instead of heaping it up for themselves, they're to help those less fortunate, according to the next verse. Paul now gives the second positive command for the rich. Look at verse 18. 
Let them do good that they might be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. Paul says, let them do good, and then he defines what the good is that the rich are to be involved in. And so the fourth and last command is the I on your acrostic. Involvement in good works is a must for the rich. Involvement in good works is a must for the rich. Paul says, let them do good, which indicates, and remember, you're rich, okay? Remember that. It means that we must do good with the money that God has given us. And then he defines three ways in which we are to do good with the money God's given us. Notice, notice first of all, first of all, they're to be rich in good works. They're to be rich in good works. Just like they're known for having earthly riches, they should be known for being rich in good works. Ladies, others should watch the life and see that indeed you might have a lot of money, but you do a lot of good things with it. You don't hoard it up. You are rich in good works. You're not like the rich men in James 5 who live in ple pleasure and luxury while oppressing those less fortunate than yourself. Now, the second thing the rich should be doing is to be ready to give, which means you should be eager to impart. You should be good at imparting the things that God has given you. That's why I asked you this week to give away something you value, to see uh, what, what you saw about your heart. And uh, I think that's a good exercise, uh, to give something away. We should not be stingy. Um, Debbie and I met a woman it's been three or four years ago when we were in Atlanta and we stayed in her home. I was speaking at her church and I remember, I mean, I couldn't say anything. I couldn't say anything like, well, I don't have that book or uh, I don't have this. And she'd go to the bookstore and buy it and bring it back to the house. In fact, the evening before we went to bed, do you remember this? Debbie made a comment that she liked uh, Skittles. And the next morning we got and there's a bowl of Skittles for Debbie. <laughs> and in fact, we're getting ready to go there in May again, not to her church, but we're going to stay in her house for three days and we're going to have to be careful about what we say because if we say we don't have something, that we'll have it. And uh, they are obviously very, very wealthy. And uh, But this is the way that woman is. If you say something, she's going to go get it for you. And uh, she's going to purchase uh, whatever you want immediately. Um, and so that's the idea that Paul's saying. Be ready to give. Be eager to give. If you have money, and uh, it doesn't mean you have to buy Skittles. If someone just says they want Skittles or whatever. But uh, just be ready to give. I know when we were better off financially, that's the way my husband was. He was always, well, let's do this, let's do that. I'm like, oh, let's don't do that. And uh, he was ready to give. I think he has a gift of giving. The third way we're to show benevolence is by being willing to share which means to share what God has given to us with others. Um, I think even about uh, Debbie renting out her house to three girls right now. She doesn't even know. Less, you know. They're all three less than 25, but she's willing to share what God has given her with somebody else. And remember, Paul's already written about the need to care for widows uh, and for the elders in the church, so that would be something that rich people could do with their money that has eternal value. But I think of other things. Uh, you could pay a college student's tuition, especially um, if he wanted to go into the pastorate. I know back when we did have money, my husband did that for several young men that were gonna go into the ministry and he paid for their college tuition. Uh, you could support missionaries, you could give to the orphans, you could uh, help widows. There's so many eternal things that the rich could do with their money that have eternal value. And lastly, Paul says they should be willing to share, which means they should not only give of what they have, but it also could include here fellowshipping with those who are of a lower class than you. Fellowshipping with those who are of a lower class than you are. Ladies, you are not any better than anybody else. We are not better than those. In fact, this morning I was walking, and I'm sure I ran into a homeless woman, and my heart just went out to her. And, but you know what? I'm not any better than she is. God is the, the creator of her, and he is the creator of me as well. And we must remember, Christ died for them as well. And in glory, there's going to be no financial distinctions, right? God owns it all. 
In fact, I love the passage in Acts. I wish we'd get back to there where it says, Now everyone who believed were together. They had all things in common. And they sold their possessions and their goods, and they divided them among all as anyone had need. So they just put all their stuff together, and they go, oh, you have a need? Okay, we'll give you this. You have a need? We'll give you that. And uh, sometimes I think we should get back to that. Paul says in Galatians 6.10, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all men, but especially those who are of the household of faith. And in Hebrews 13.16, Do not forget to do good and to share. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Well, Paul now ends this section on the rich with a reason why they should help others with their money instead of hoarding their money. Notice what he says in verse 19. Storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they might lay hold on eternal life. So, instead of taking their money and storing it up for themselves, storing it up here on earth, they're to store it up in heaven. They are to set their affection on things above and store up treasure in heaven. Ladies, Jesus warns about this in Matthew 5, 19. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust and thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust does corrupt nor where thieves cannot break in and steal. And then he goes on to say, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Another reason I want you to give something away this week you highly value because it does show where our heart is. And Paul says they need to store up for themselves a good foundation that is not set on the sinking sand of money, which comes and goes, but on the solid rock of Christ, who is our glory to come. And by doing so, he says, you will surely lay hold on eternal life, the life to come. And ladies, if you were careful in reading that verse, Remember Paul already mentioned that in verse 12. Remember when he says, fight the good fight of faith, what? Lay hold on eternal life. And here again, he talks about the importance of laying hold on eternal life. Ladies, those who are rich and use their riches to help others show their real foundation it is in glory, not in their money here and now. They realize God gave them wealth, and they want to use it to help others and not spend it on their own pleasures. Thomas Brooks once said this, There are three things that earthly riches can never do. They can never satisfy divine justice. They can never pacify divine words. And they can never quiet a guilty conscience. Until these three things are done, man is undone, he says. In fact, it was interesting, just this last week, I went to H&R Block to pick up our tax returns, and as I was paying my bill, the man that was checking me out, he said, well, he said, I see here that you bought the peace of mind policy. And I looked at him and I said, sir, no amount of money will buy peace of mind. And he didn't know what to do with it. And he looked at me and he said, that's really a wise statement. And uh, probably should have gone on and shared the gospel with them. But even though H&R Block sells a peace of mind policy, there is no peace of mind in that. So I thought it was kind of ironic, actually. Money can't buy peace of mind, can it? Can it? So let's summarize the four commands for the rich. Riches are not to be trusted. Ladies, since every one of us in this room is more than likely rich in comparison to the rest of the world, I would ask you, are you trusting in riches? You know, we have no guarantee that the economy of this world is not going to collapse. And according to scripture, we know it is going to collapse, right? Revelation talks about Babylon in one hour collapses. The merchants are no more, nothing, the... Nothing is anymore in one hour. So, will such a world event shake you to the point of doubting the goodness of God? Do you trust in your bank account, IRAs, 401ks, stock investments, life insurance, or any other investments? Secondly, involvement in good works is a must for the rich. Biblically speaking, Involvement in good works is a must for all of God's children, right? Whether you're rich or poor. We've already seen from 1 Timothy, the widows that are to be put on the list, they should have been involved in good works. What good works are you involved in right now? 
Do part of those good works involve trying to relieve those less fortunate than you? C. Confidence for the rich must be in God alone. Do you trust in God alone? Is he enough for you when times are tough financially? Do you trust him to provide for your needs as he has promised? And then lastly, in fact, the other night I was telling my husband, I said, do we have enough for retirement? And he said, no. And I said, does that not bother you? And he said, no, the Lord will take care of us. So, uh, you know, he's got more faith than I do. The H is haughtiness is forbidden. Haughtiness is forbidden. Do you think you are better than those that are on welfare due to no cause of their own? Are you proud of your husband's well-paying job? And do you look down upon those whose husband barely makes enough to support his family? Do you associate with those who are in a different social class than you are? The lyrics of a song that was written just a little over seven years ago came to my mind while I was writing this lesson. And the fact, the song is entitled Psalm 6210, which comes from the verse which says, Do not trust in oppression, nor vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase, don't set your heart on them. These words I want to close with are just a brief part of the song and are really what I want to challenge you with as we close. So if you'll just listen to these words in closing. The songwriter says, Find rest my soul in God alone, amid the world's temptations. When evil seeks to take a hold, I'll cling to my salvation. Though riches come and riches go, don't set your heart upon them. The fields of hope in which I sow are harvested in heaven. Oh, praise him, hallelujah. My delight and my reward, everlasting, never failing. My redeemer, my God. I trust that's the heart prayer of each of us. Let's pray. Oh, Father, you are our delight. You are our reward. Father, we do live in an age that is, teaches us that money is everything, and yet it is not. You are everything. God, we need your help because here in America, we are so wealthy. We have no idea how poor the rest of the world is, and I pray, God, that you would help us as we are like the church at Laodicea that is rich and we're increased with goods and we think we have little need of anything, but little do we know we're blind, we're miserable, and we're wretched, and we're naked. And so God help us this week. I pray that we would not forget these lessons that we've had on money, and that we would treat it appropriately as you would have us to, knowing that one day it's not going to even matter, because you own everything anyway. And so, Lord, give us grace in these days. Help us to put our trust in you alone, because you are enough. In Christ's name, amen.